Hello, uh, this is a quick session on the 28th of September with Weida and Counterfeit. Um, today, I will be stepping into the play-by-play -play role. Peter will be stepping into the color caster role as oh an exercise to... As, as a role to kind of, as an exercise to kind of flip the roles around, trying to figure out what you would prefer coming out of the other part of the roles, because roles in CFT are a lot more dynamic than they would be in a League of Legends or potentially even a Counter Strike, right? We don't know what's the correct thing to do here. So getting an, an extra person's thoughts on the correct way of approaching, um, approaching a different role than one that are normally in is super valuable, just to kind of figure out where can the other person really improve and, and help the other person get the best out of themselves as well yeah i'm not going to be trying to like have deep insights onto uh what's going on in the game i think what i'm going to try and do is just shift what i see as my responsibilities in the cast to try and give wita as much extra information that he may not be able like fully engaged with at that point to just sort of inform his points and give him more to talk about yeah, and, and with that in mind, let's head into it. We, as we can see, we are doing a, a cast of the Hex League. I think that's a generally a fantastic resource as well if you're looking for any VODs uh, for high tier competitive mm. TFT. Uh, they have good production as well, which is always nice. So you know that everything you're getting is is good. It's, it's well observed. It has all the correct overlays and stuff like that. You kind of get used to what it's like having a, a, a traditional workflow on a on a, a normal broadcast here so let's kind of head into the game even though both Sean's and doki are very very uh, handsome men i think it's preferable to go into the game i will say the disadvantage for the hex league is definitely going to be you, you can't kind of listen back to the commentary unless you speak french and compare what you're doing but yeah the production value is very very good uh, i'm honestly jealous of some of the, the hex league setups i've seen before yeah, so again, this is the game one of a day, so there's going to be a lot of fluff to get through here, but I think we are going to have the portals, and uh, what the hell is Sable Mouvant? Is that Shifting uh, Sands? Yes, I think that's a reasonable guess. Okay, so we obviously have Yorick's Graveyard, which is Symmetria de Yorick, and then we have Kefros du Clipt, which is like e e Ecliptic, Ecliptic Vaults. Yep. Yes. All right. I think ecliptic is almost a French word in the first place, so it helps. I mean, a lot of the words in the English language does come from Fra from French because it was, well, linka Franca for a long time, right? So a lot of the boring words have come for that, but that's we're besides breaking the, down the uh, We're breaking down language. We're casting language today. Yeah. Uh, I need to use my degree for something, right? No. Um, but now, uh, looking at this here, um, so as you can see here, uh, Peter, uh, in our lobby, I'm looking at names like, you know, Tixida, I'm looking at Volterix, I'm looking at Potter Bull, I'm looking at Kenobi. All of these players are, are, are really like big names to a certain extent here and, and across the entirety of the EMEA space. Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, there's a reason why France is one of the biggest hitters as we will head to that Ecliptic Vault. I mean, this is just such an incredible lobby to open up the day. You know, we've also got a good friend Kenobi, of course, who's been on the broadcast with us before. So I think we're going to be seeing something pretty special all the way from game one. Yeah, and even someone like TLT, I remember back when we started doing Rising Legends, he kind of came through and was like one of the more noticeable names in and around the circuit here on the new representation with Esports Lucerne, right? They previously had Tian actually all the way back in set three and under their wings as well. So have have had Hypno as well in the French scene. So a lot of, of interesting people have been under their wings here. And Peter, this opening also seems really interesting to me. Yeah, we've got Vegeta getting themselves a very good setup early on for the challenges. Of course, again, ecliptic vaults means we're going to be seeing a lot more money flowing into these lobbies. So we'll see if our players are more willing to spend that money knowing they're getting it further down the line, or if they'll hoard it jealously and try and get an incredibly strong late game board. Yeah, and Peter, I, I kind of want to know here, because like more money coming through, right? But like, does that have any major implications on, on what can happen in terms of hitting specific reroll compositions like what what is like the big thing that we need to keep an eye out for with this extra gold coming through well i think a big thing is going to be as you pointed out before the openings our players are getting to try and provide them that direction throughout the game i mean from, you can see from kenobi here has managed to hit a decent amount of the one cost coming in i would be honestly be a little surprised if we see people going too too crazy for rerolls unless they find something very good early on because as we were talking about before, the potential for crazy late game boards is always going to be there. The specter above this game. Yeah, and this is for a quick note as well here. This is um, 
games on the previous B patch, right? So this is not with the Fiora nerfs and the gotta go fast nerfs, all these bigger nerfs that came through in 13.19, Peter, right? So should mm. be an interesting one to follow. Yeah, it means that rogues are still a ongoing concern in this lobby. Of course, as we've mentioned before, though, we have got some pretty powerful players looking for the perfect choice for their first Orgwin. Contagion will keep Kenobi nice and open. As we noted before, his bench is pretty wide. But for Par de Bol, of course, another legendary player, he chooses his direction straight away. On this patch, of course, Brawlers being an absolute menace. It's kind of funny that you want to have... Uh... Kenobi, or, or, like, open broad mind. He should be able to be contained with that contagion. No, we shouldn't get the entire lobby sick. That seems like a bad idea. <laughs> it's a bad idea for everybody else, but a good idea for him. Of a Volta, he's also had a good idea of his own, which is finding three pills over from the beginning of the game and pumping up as well. This is going to lead to, again, one of these incredibly strong late-game situations. You can see on the other side, Opal, with the challenges, has got a pretty damn good you know, damage dealing early game composition to try and make sure Volta doesn't get there. Yeah, and, and the big thing here for me, right, Peter, is that we are in a new set, so the biggest thing for me, interesting here, is going to figure out which route does he end up cashing out on, right? Because we don't necessarily have the standard path of I'm going to play this caching off the back of a cache from Pildo in 9.5 just yet. So that's going to be pretty interesting to me here as well. Looking at the setup now, we see Opali hitting that two-star Samira, Peter. Um, I assume this is still a, a very good spot, but I feel like... Is there anything that Opala here should be wary of, kind of going into the later stages of the stage? Well, we know, you know, again, much like we saw with the Brawler Emblem before, having the Challenger Augment from the very beginning means we are very much locked into this route. Interesting to see the Night Harvester being brought in early on. I imagine we're going to be seeing Opala trying to put together a win streak here, but from what we've seen so far, you know, Kenobi going up to level 5, I think maintaining the win streak in this lobby could be a bit dicey. Yeah, uh, I think that's a big thing that we need to keep an eye out for further down the road here because who ended up tagging Kenobi? Like, they could take a lot of damage. This could be really scary. And speaking of big scary monsters, Peter, Cho'Gath reroll seems to be on the cards here for Padabon. One thing I will note, though, is as you see Padabon taking a fairly heavy hit there, you, know, you want to, if you're going to be staying at lower level, as you, we've already noted, Kenobi has started moving up levels quickly, your board is going to be weaker, so even getting those feast stacks off is going to be tricky, and you will be taking the damage early on. But let's take a quick step in with our friends over on the left-hand side. We noted that rogues are still an ongoing concern in this patch. Vegeta has locked himself into that route from the beginning. Yeah, but like, for me as well here, Peter, we see two people. On Pildover's back, we have a TLT on a Pildover setup as well. We had we saw Volta on that as too. Which implications will that have uh, throughout this game? Well, you were talking before about the idea of having, you know, the different approaches to Pildover. As we see from Volta, we've got very much the Lost Streak building up towards the Pumpy Amp. From, from TLT, we have got the Shimmering Inventors in there, which can potentially turn to a much more powerful uh, earlier game composition because you're just getting raw power in. I think for the time being, Let's see, where, where is TLT? Roughly in the middle. If he can keep together a win streak, he's getting paid out, or potentially paid out, every round from the Shimmering Inventors. So can it still spend some of that money and put together a decently strong board with, indeed, an Echo Tour, as we glimpse there. I'm looking at the bottom of the screen, so we've got to, got to see like what's on each player's board here, as well as some of their itemizations as well. This is just a nice little overview that we have. And kind of looking at some interesting stuff here, we see Croco with that um, Sonya's Paradox there on a Samira currently. You would assume that would get moved to a different unit later down the road, but could be interesting. Again, keeping an eye on a Kenobi, Opale, and Tuxedo, I think, is the most important thing here, right? Because those are a hundred H those are a hundred HP players right now. Yeah, particularly Tuxedo, we haven't seen a ton of have the hopefully we'll get a chance to check in on a bit because oh well, there we go. I was wondering why we were seeing two instances of the units on the board, and we get to see the answer right there in front of us. So an early move into the Invokers, making use of a double-up version of Galio. I think once, if Texita can get just maybe one more win in here, I think he can go into Stage 3 feeling extremely confident. Yeah, obviously you want to get that streak going again. The win here will take you above 20 and get that extra interest flowing for when you get that fourth win, as you're pointing out, Peter. So that will be big. And, and I'm actually super excited to see where this board is going to be going here. Because again, as I said about the Pildover cash outs as well, for me as personally, I am not too familiar with the Double Trouble Lines as of right now either. Yeah, I mean, we could still be seeing this board transferred across to the, you know, the standard classic Talia setup. 
as much as we have seen a few different approaches to double up being in place. Certainly the Onyx Park, the only slammed item so far, as Texita will lose that streak, falling victim to Kenobi. We noted before, Kenobi did push the early levels, has got a very strong board. Apart is, I think, I'm going to follow suit, leaving us with two win streaking players just before our second stage ends. Potentially, they could fight each other, as we can see right now, Peter. They have each other in the pool. That could be absolutely massive in terms of being able to guarantee the streaks here. At the bottom of your screen is Volta, at 67. We are not even done mm. with stage two yet. Again, uh, most people should know this by now, uh, and I think that you're, you're probably second this as well, Peter, but the the, uh, the common cash up point here is going to be free 5 but even then, we are that far down the HP pool. That, that, that has to be scary, right? Well, I mean, this brings in the whole Ecliptic Vaults thing, and we're about to see even more gold flowing to the economy. You know, will our players use it to level up? Will they use it to reroll? So far, the answer to that question seems to be mostly pushing levels on creating these very strong boards. I do worry for players like Volta, whether or not, even if they get, you know, a decent cash out, whether they'll be able to turn it around and actually get themselves the late game they want. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also like super excited to see where this rogue bot ends up here, right? Because we, we know that this rogue spat, it really frees up the composition a lot. You're able to, to cut something like the Graves, for example. You can play a more Slayer-centric line with Mordekaiser as a secondary carry. There's something that I've spoken with, with Brubber about, who's one of the, the primary rogue players currently on the EOS ladder. It, it, it's super fun. It's super exciting to watch. I know you kind of said that he hated it. So like, why are you, why, why do you hate rogues, Peter? <laughs> No, I definitely don't hate rogues in this particular patch. I do want to take a second out, though, just to acknowledge what's on the right-hand side of our screen. We have got multiple huge streaks running for our French players. We noted right back at the beginning of the lobby, this is an absolute glitterati of French players who are all incredibly good. But for TLT, Croco, Volta, all with lost streaks, a pal Kenobi with win streaks, on top of the Ecliptic Vaults money, which is a lot of money, we're going to be seeing that streak goal as well. Does this whole lobby is absolutely flush with cash. Yeah, speaking of that, cash will be spent here now coming through from Pada Ball. He's rolling down 3-1. We know he wants to try to hit all of those free stars. At least get as close as possible before he reaches that golden 30-ish breakpoint here. But never mind, Peter. Ooh. He starts sending it further and further down. That's a bit of an interesting one for sure because that's not something that we're normally used to seeing here. Will he stop with the free star crocodile? No, he says no. <laughs> He's got a very tempting shot here as well. Rek'Sai and Vi both to be added in. I think for Potable, I mean, this is not absolutely perfect. We're still short by quite a few Cho'Gas. But I think the board is hopefully going to be strong enough to get the goal back in his pocket by way of a win streak. Yeah, but as you're talking about as well, the win streak here, I think, is pretty interesting. But also, Peter, you've been talking a lot about this Ecliptic Vaults here. There's going to come a lot of gold through here once this next augment mm. is going to pick up. So I assume that's something that makes this spot look a little bit less egregious than it, than it probably is in reality. And also looking at someone like TLT here, getting even further into that lost streak on the on the pill over here. That's going to be something scary to look out for. We head into our second augment. It will be prismatic. Note that Kenobi and Apal are both still win streaking. So if they can land some decent augments now that keep them in that spot, we're going to be seeing players like Volta, Kroko, maybe even Vegeta and TLT start to plummet down on the HP totals in Stage 3. Yeah, and Kenobi, oh, double Shurima spats, Peter, so he's going Ooh. down the vertical Shurima route. This is super exciting. This is not something that you, I feel like you see a lot of right now. I feel like most people stop at Nasus and then just play a seer right i feel like that's the that's the common thing right now because Rima has been moved from a two to a three you you seem like you have a lot more flexibility here but what do you like where will these spats end up further down the road which are the key well, units to look out for here on kenobi's board well something i'm really thinking about uh we have really long term for kenobi is he's in such a good spot we know again there's a ton of money in the lobby he's had a massive win streak put together I don't think that Sharima 9 is out of the question for him here at all, because even if the win streak doesn't maintain in place, and it seems like it's probably going to, uh, he's got a ton of money and a ton of time, which is what all this winning in Stage 2 has bought him. He's got time to move up to level 9 and be one of our frontrunners to first the lobby. Also, I think that one of the more important things we haven't really spoken too much about, the fact that he hasn't hit Opale at all, right? Like, both of these players right mm. now are still a hundred streak. Never mind, Peter. <laughs> I knew it. That's that's what I did. I didn't mention it because I knew it was going to happen at that very moment. To be fair, though, Apali is running a ball, which I think is going to 
well, was, I think, pretty much due to fall off a cliff. But for part of Ball, we have got a champion duplicator on the left-hand side. It will be cashed in. This board is online officially and on a win streak as well. So Kenobi, as strong as his board is, he's now got an active contender who's coming after him. Yeah, and for me as well, I think this is the exciting thing here, uh, if I was watching at home, the fact that he's just going to be able to just fully push levels now, because he's every single unit he needs to hit, this backline could become really scary somewhere down the road. One thing I will note here is, you know, we're talking about briefly the rogues from before. This is going to be one of those compositions that will not be very happy to run into the rogues. I mean, the brawlers, you know, they've given themselves an enormous amount of front line to work with. But the back line, the Cassiopeia we saw there just getting deleted. And without her in the mix and with Rexline not really being a main damage source, this composition becomes more vulnerable, even if it's good enough right now. Yeah, but we also know there are some positioning things that I don't feel like people are really discovering too much in the set just yet, right? Because rogues are, are so weird a lot of the time, I feel, comparative to some of the other assassin traits that we've had in the past, right? Because you can't really flip your board on its head the way you used to be able to. Uh, you have to kind of do some other weird positioning things from like what I've seen other top players do on stream and stuff. Didn't really come through right there, but again, it's also the age-old debate, Peter. Is it really worth it to position around one particular matchup every time? I think when so much, I think for the time being, for so much of the Brawler board, the damage is coming from the Cassiopeia on the back line, making some effort to preserve her is going to be important, but I wanted to turn our eyes to Volta because we haven't spent too much time with him recently, and hopefully we're about to, yes, he has been playing the long game for a while, he's on a 25 potential cash out here, mentioned a 3-5, we're going to see the money spent here by Volta to try and make sure that cash out comes in before everybody else's board goes off hugely. My big concern here is because we've had so much money in this lobby so far, that the usual tempo of the game has been thrown off from where it would be normally, and maybe Volta actually isn't strong enough to keep up with these boards and get that win he so desperately needs. Yeah, this is going to be a big fight here, and he goes up against Potter Ball's board here. Almost shades of Super Brawl from, from Yonder, where we saw these two players grief mm. each other constantly, even though it's on the same team. But here right now, you can see the Chogath in the front line doing all of the work together with that Renekton backline here, the Jinx, with the IE and the J and the Last Whisper. You're trying to do her utmost to get through, but these brawls are just way too tangy. There's not enough damage. It's not that Jace, too. None of the things that really make this composition tick, Peter, is coming through right now. But that's an additional extra amount out of gold coming through on the cash out but he's down to his 14 hp he has tiny titan but even then this is still pretty dicey yeah volta i think it's really just got that's one last chance in this round if it goes forward to stage four you know we're going to be seeing particularly once the set next open comes in we're going to be seeing our, our players in this lobby having spent all of that money and their boards will just become completely overwhelmingly strong i wouldn't hate seeing volta really just throwing the money at the wall here trying to get an upgrade because this, if this next round doesn't go his way, I could very much see Volta going out early in stage four. Yeah, so here we go, another try here. Croco's board is a little bit more doable in terms of being able to, it's a little bit weaker, but that's a prismatic dual lotus. Kaiser and Fiora already online. The, the entire TX is just going to be done and dusted in that second. Fiora is still in that front line, in the back line now. On the Jinx here on Volta. Oh, that's still a Sonia's Paradox. The mana is going to come through fast enough. That is the big question coming through here. Just oh. about the passing. Volta is not in the game. 12 HP to his name. But now, Peter, we're going to get to 4-1. People are going to roll down. It's getting more and more scary. This was a real tough decision being taken by Volta there to say, you know what, I'm going to try and play to a better finish than I could go for otherwise. I think if he'd spent all his money there to try and, you know, get the win he is limiting how far he can go in the game in this case with a little bit of extra hp trickling in he's got a chance but exactly as you said the window is closing on volta very very quickly and i mean you know he's lo a long way off from hitting level eight i think in stage four one we've just got to see it absolutely pitch everything in and hope for the best some defensive options here with that belt coming through. Jay's upgrade, also something that could be interesting to, to look out for here in the second. And I like the fact that we're staying, we see even people around this lobby are Croco, 38 HP, right? And these are the people that he has to kind of be to get above in the standings as well. So that's going to be really interesting to see whether or not that entire flip's going to prove because we see Pot of Ball still win streaking. Croco just having a massive roll down right there. Look at this, Peter. This is scary. Mm. Oh, boy. I was trying to keep an eye out on who Volta could potentially play in this round. At least it's not part of Ball, which would, would be the nightmare because he's the only win-streaking player. 
We'll keep an eye on the right-hand side to see how Volta ends up doing. Up against Upal, who, of course, has been running the challenges since the beginning of the game. Yeah, and again, look at the Jinx here in the MC road position I was talking about a little bit earlier on. Now, getting into the back line here, this Irelia still holds all of the items that's supposed to go onto that Fiora. Pali is going for the level 8 roll down instead of the seam, so that's going to be a huge boon for Voltariax here. The rest of the lobby probably swearing right now at Opale, the fact they let him cash out. They were ever so close to eliminating him, and now, Peter, he's going to cash out on a round where he has extra time to work with as well, because it is, in fact, one of these Auckland rounds. Yeah, I mean, that's such a huge sigh of relief for Volta. I suppose the silver lining for the rest of the lobby is this did take longer than it was intended to. And as I said, there are going to be matchups here for this this cannoneer, as they call it in France, or gunner board, uh, that are not going to be good matchups. So there's only so far this cash out can kind of turn that around. But we've got some good roles coming in from Volta. I mean, having immediately the Heimerdinger online, the itemization is a little iffy because we've already got ourselves a last whisper and the edge of night is only okay but i mean this is do or die for volta i could even see him going out in this round if he doesn't make it i mean he also has we look at it from my, from my aspect right he has two he has two of these performers he has three removers the options are a plenty we see take cedar sport here has come online now that's a rocket for brief assault before can it do enough? It's only still on the two items here. It has a Shurima emblem on the bench that hasn't really been put into play either just yet. We do see this Giant Slayer coming through as well here, but can this Serac, a little bit more of a, an un untraditional build coming through here, see if that gets enough to take down Volta's board for just a single fight right now. This makes it even more scary to be Volta right now, down to just 6 HP. Oh, my mistake on taking the loss there. But yeah, Volta's extra HP trickling in is enough to keep him afloat, but... We need to get absolutely perfect items. We can see from the, the Radiant items just got thrown directly onto Jason on the other side of the board. At least there's now a little bit of time to get that tiny bit of extra front line in, which will buy, hopefully buy enough time for these gunners to really come online. We see, we are going to see all of the items recontextualized here. And you noticed the rogue positioning before, or anti-rogue positioning for the Jinx. We now got the Edge of Night as well as another way to make sure she remains a relevant damage threat. You can kind of see here as well, it seems like the Aphelios is going to be the end game destination. Even a Jinx free potentially as well. The options are a plenty right now. Now this anti-rope position is going to come out thick and fast here. Yes, this Kiana does reach it, but again, it's an anti-repair turret. And unfortunately, the oh. other backlines are going to intubate this here away. He actually didn't do it in time. And now, is there enough there to take on this Kiana? She has it, that Death's Defiance. And now it's all on Jace and Terry. Uh, Jace and Sejuani, sorry, but the Jace has no items here, but the damage is coming back sooner rather than later. It's paying, and paying her back, and now it's going to be a win for Vault. a very big one as well. But Vegeta was probably hoping for a bit more, Peter. Oh, boy, that was nail-biting. One thing I loved, and we'll talk about a little bit more when we come back uh, to the board, hopefully we'll get a chance to, it's the, the setup there with the Edge of Night and the Heimerdinger turret working together to kind of provide Jinx with multiple yeah. extra lives. It still didn't wasn't enough to keep her alive to the end of the round, but it was enough time to to allow for the rest of the rogues to get deleted. I mean, that's going to be one of the ways to deal with the board is just last long enough because the rogues are not built to last in long rounds. Also, I just like the fact that the way, like, even with all the extra speed that Volta gets from Tiny as Titan, Vegeta still is just there patiently waiting to deny him the, the Aatrox, right? Uh, I, I just love that. It's just, like, a great little bit of fun here. But now, rolling down again, Peter, trying to find that couple of few upgrades that are still needed here. Again, we, got, we I feel like we've seen a shift into triple repair of and boards like this now. Not so much the Shred needed, because I guess it's the Eternal Whisper and stuff like that that really means that you can kind of skip on some of the other more traditional Heimerdinger upgrades and just go for an extra frontliner. I mean, absolutely. It's all about buying time. We've got a Gangplank in the frontline as well. So, you know, we're going to have the ship coming in. I mean, we'll see how this works here because you know this is going to be more of a traditional front to back fight and we haven't necessarily you know gone for you know the Gwinsus or the runan's hurricane to spread that damage around from jinx she's going to need a little bit more time because she sacrificed damage for safety yeah, but now you don't have to do that anymore, because look at how strong this board is positional positioning period just absolutely tears kenobi's board apart here that is something that we need to keep an eye out for hmm we've got a chance to bring in a second gangplank with the potential of the gangplank 2 as well longer term i'm keeping a close eye on whether volta might be as you said thinking about making the move across to the aphelios 2 once that comes a calling but 
in terms of his overall game position, he's got a good win streak. We know, of course, he has no safety net at all. Any of these players left in the lobby could be the final one he faces, but he is clawing away at the HP of these lower HP players. We've got multiple ones in the 30s and 40s now who are starting to look a little bit more vulnerable. Yeah, but we do see some upgrades coming through here with Pala hitting a Kaiser 2. I mean, we also have Pala Ball's board on our screens. Peter still doesn't have the Bramble Vest to really help this along. But now it's time to figure out whether or not that lack here will be detrimental to this fight. On paper, this is a bad matchup, but there's still only just a Fiora 1 here. So that's something you gotta keep in mind here. The big all-stars here are gonna be that Kaiser in the back line. Gotta move fast here, providing some continuous value all throughout these fights. But can the Renekton, can the Choke Gav, and can the Casio Pair provide enough damage? It seems like it can here now. Another cast coming through from this two-star. Kaiser doesn't really kill anything off note right now. There's just too much damage HP on this board for for this moment of too few items on the side of Apollo. He's looking like he might be going eighth. I mean, that is definitely a very good setup there for Apollo Ball against the ball that doesn't have any way of getting rid of the Cassiopeia. The Brawlers, if they've got anything, it's an enormous amount of beef. And I don't think that this four challenger board has got enough damage to be able to punch through it. I mean, we, maybe, we get maybe one more item coming in, but ideally you want to be in Kroko's position, as we saw briefly there, to have that three item Kaiser who can maybe, just maybe, do enough damage to actually punch through the front line in a good amount of time. Yeah, and I think that's something we got to keep in mind here, right? Because we, we all know, Peter, we all know as we talk about, Kaiser is the star of that composition. In pure DPS output, you need the, the survivability on the Fiora. But now, this is six gunners, Peter. Well, that is looking mighty fine. <laughs> it does still have the same conundrum that we've got for Volta going on, though. The you know, six gunner is very, very strong, but you're still going to need a rock solid front line to be able to survive. And right now, we've got one stars on the Sidrani, one star on the Sign as well. I do wonder if TLT might run into problems of, you know, while he's got obviously multiple carries in play here, that the front line won't last long enough to let them really go off. And speaking of multiple carries, Texita has a pair, and it's going to be the same units here as well. You can see both of the Saragas equipped with some items here. The Saraga free now being threatened by that Echo directly into the backline, but it seems like the Death Cap is not enough to take out the Soraka here. So it's just like slices and casts those bananas left, right, and centers as the stars are falling down, taking out the Jinx, and there the Ash falls as well. And now TLT going very low. You know, someone might even try to replace that first T with a bean and eat him like a BLT. I was sure you were going for some sort of banana split jug. I was readying myself for that the entire way through what you were saying, but perhaps another day. Volta, though, on that massive, massive win streak, nobody so far has been able to beat him, and he's been able to build back up his HP thanks to that Tanius Titan. He's now at a point where maybe even one loss will not eliminate him, whereas Vegeta and TLT, as you said, they are getting into the danger zone. Volta is on an absolute tear, and I think he's going to be shaping the rest of this lobby unless something dramatic happens in these next couple of rounds. And speaking of dramatic moments here, Volta slowly but surely climbing way more HP back here to 42 power TX. Potentially could be going directly onto the Soraka if the front line is removed in time here. Jinx comes in, the boat comes in as well. Lots of CC in that front line now. And will the Soraka be able to keep off the power? Doesn't seem like it. Tixida slowly but surely bleeding out here as Volteri has, as Volteri has found stability at the bottom of the standings here. Vegeta now, the next one on the chopping block. Kroko all the way down to 5 HP here. And Vegeta's rogue board also takes a loss to this gotta go fast Fiora Peter we're looking at 5 HP we're looking at 40 we're looking at 17 it's ever so close yeah the good well so the silver lining for Tech Cita after that last round is he's got HP to fall back on and that's true for part of as well but for the rest of the lobby time is running out in a hurry I think Croco is going to be cursing this game because you know under normal circumstances this should be a good enough ball but the Ecliptic Vaults, they've shaped everything from start to end. We've just got a whole new rarefied layer of how absolutely cracked these balls can be. Kenobi, we talked about it before. The Nine Streamer, fueled by all this money, is online. This board is absolutely ridiculous. On a ball here, it gets the Cho'Gath away from that Kasante now, meaning it's just going to be able to do its thing without really being impacted at all here now. Sign into the backline, disrupting the Seer, disrupting the Kaiser. But slowly but surely, here, gotta keep in mind, there's only that, there's only that cash you pay on the backline here. Kasante is on us as well here. It's not gonna get knocked away just yet, but into the corner it goes. The Kaiser, unaffected, continues the healing up with the power of that 
Serena spat here, and that's another massive loss here coming through as Vegeta is the first one caught from the game. Oh boy, I mean, this is the whole thing though. If you're building a board quite heavily around the one cost and things, it does make sense that Shurima 9 should be able to just be on a whole different level than you long term. I think the big concern going forward into the back half of stage 5 is just going to be what order we're seeing our players pruned in. You know, Apal, TLT, Croco, they're all on a single life. Volta, you know, has already leapfrog up to, up to a top 4 position. It's of course going to make a huge amount of difference to each of those current bottom three players where they end up. Fifth is so much better than seventh. Yeah, and all those points here, they're so important. This, these are five game game days. Sure, they have five of them as well, Peter, but you got to get off to a good start on a single every single play day, right? Because you just got to guarantee that level of like comfortability, all of that confidence in your gameplay for the rest of the day. It's so important to get off to a good start here. And TLT right now, next in a chopping block, unable to find that Jace free. As he goes into his potential final fight, he's gonna be against Volterix support. That's still streaking, still healing with those tiniest titans. It got a mirror matchup, and that's one of the most exciting things to look out for. One thing I want to note as well from Volta's board, you can see that the, with Vegeta having left the game and the rogues now being out of the picture, the Radiant Edge of Night has been moved onto the Gangplank on the front line, which gives you such quicker access to the ship coming in. It means that TLT and Apal are both out of there. Kenobi goes down to a single life. So we've got a real hard battle for top four. Yeah, I assume that he was the one that could be needing a brand new day with that Brink of Dawn, but no, gonna go out here in seven, in sixth, actually, Opali going out in ninth here, so a bit of a bonus here with CLT, it was looking very scary, but next up is looking scary for Kenobi, it's looking scary for Kroko as well. A really interesting ball setup here, you know, because we didn't get necessarily the pure attack speed items we maybe would have liked, so this board is relying very, very heavily on the Kaiser to get the job done. Which I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of. I mean, a lot of the gold has been spent on leveling up rather than upgrading units. We've still got Onassis at one star. We've still got Cassante at one star as well. I don't know, but we'll find out who's going to be in the top four right now. Oh, this is going to be a Kaiser versus Kaiser focused matchup here. Right? Even though that two star Aatrox gets deleted by the Fiora, it is going to come back at some point here. But now it's all on the Kaiser for the damage. The Cassandra is doing its best to chip in here. But as of right now, that Sonya's Paradox is procced on the opposition Kaiser here. It is such a massive one here. Now, will the second Kaiser be able to get out of time? It is not in Kenobi. Going out in fifth place here. It says no Aatrox respawn coming through in time. And Croco lives for a top four here. But Volterix, Peter, he's still streaking as well. Like, he's going to come for that crown, whether he want it or not. Yeah, I think at this point, Croco is very happy to have made the top four at all. We know Volta is, you know, the angel of death coming for pretty much everybody else in the lobby. Yeah, maybe you can squeak out a win against, but we can see from the gold turtles on the top there, part of balls he's spending pretty aggressively. Texita is holding on to a little bit because he's got the HP to do so, but for Croco, I would be absolutely astonished if he can pull off anything more than the top four. Yeah, I think this is a position where you look at this game and like, okay, I'm super happy to be in the top four here as well, right? Like, you have kind of everything you need, but you don't really have extra tank items for the uh, for the for the Javan, for example, right? But look, it's pure... Like, these boards are, are crazy, man. Yeah, make money, make problems for everybody else. I think the big question we've now got for the top four is, can anybody take down Volta? Because we noticed before, Volta moved out of one life territory a while ago. He's now in two life territory, getting even stronger than that. So even if you can fluke a win against him somehow, you're going to have to do it multiple times to stop him from taking first place. Yeah, and this is going to be the fight we are going to be focusing on here. Pot of Ball versus Volta here. This Choga free will now with a Noxus Renekton in the front line, kind of providing more support here. As we also see the Sawn Rise coming through, but there's no gold in the bank, Peter, no matter how much you talk about it, which means the damage is kind of be in that relation as well, and that's going to be Pot of Ball taking a huge hit here. And if Croco actually manages to win against Texita, there is hope, but... That hope is quickly put out. It does look weird. He dies with 50 gold left, but he had nothing to roll for. There's no reason to kind of flame him in chat and be like, chatting, 50 gold, roll down, chatting, <laughs> chatting, chatting. No. But now, Peter, top three here. Take see that on the board here. If we look at this, like, it's Soraka rerolling the top three. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm really impressed with this. I keep, you know, 
I will say, in praise of the recent sets, definitely right, I've opened up the space where it's much more possible to run stuff that is, you know, things that you wouldn't normally see, stuff that you wouldn't ever expect, and still have it work pretty well. I do think Volta is on, you know, a fast course for first place, but it's really, for me, Punabol versus Texita battling out for second. Yeah, and one of these fights here is actually going to come through now. I actually don't know who wins this match, but I feel like that Declaw on a choke in the front line really should be providing enough sustainability to buy that, Ka that Cassiopeia in the back line. Enough time to start slowly, but surely chipping away. But there's also so much healing coming through from these double Sorakas here. And with the CC provided from that boat, it is seeming like the Sorakas here will prevail, will be raining down their stars. And well, part of all. He's knocked out. He will be seeing stars as he goes into third place. But now it's all on Volterix and Texida for this top two fight. And from what I've seen so far, Peter, it doesn't seem like Texida has any chance of contesting Volta's board. I mean, at this point, yeah, volta has got everything he could really dream of. The upgrade to the Heimeninger means that turret is now even harder to put down. And of course, we'll be regenerating with massive amount of defensive stats. We've got the next item coming in. For the Gangplank as well. Honestly, I, I'm so impressed by by both the Taxita put together this board, which we don't see nearly at all, and for Volta for turning a corner after a very rough ride through the early game and almost not getting the cash out at all. Yeah, now we kind of get to see the how these fights are going to play out here. This is not going to be the final fight of the game. Both of these players are on two lives right now. We can kind of see that... The, fact, the first wave of damage is actually pretty okay. It seems like, at least, from Tuxedo's board, but that, that's just, like, way too much going on on Volta's board for this to even be considerable to be coming close here. And TG's, a lot of good options here, Peter. I, honestly, I don't know what you go for. I mean, yeah, I don't see any of this really necessarily making a difference at this point. I think Volta's quite happy just to park the gangplank and say, no, this is mine. I, I think I need a, a few of these to really round out my final comp, but... I, the, the problem is, much as we saw with other compositions before, you know, building around a low-cost reroll is always going to have a cap. For Volta, I mean, this is just, you know, throwing your wallet at the screen, screaming it's down the microphone, and saying, you know what, you can't get better than this. It's almost perverted in a way, right? Like the only thing he needed to cap out was that Aatrox 2, and he just finds it even though Tuxedo is already on it. But it is now time for what we can expect to be the final fight of the game here now, looking at how these fights are going to go. Looking at Volterix's mess, but he's a 10-unit board coming out here. And then you have the cannon, you have the, you have the TX as well. And I now just look at this burst coming through here slowly, but surely the boat here will buy time in the front line. And there we go. The entirety of this board from Tuxedo has been absolutely removed from existence. And there we have it. Volteri X takes it home, wins game number one of the day. I mean, that was honestly some beautiful, beautiful play. Volta, of course, you know, a player who is a favorite of so many, showing us exactly why he's had such great longevity in the scene. All right, let's... Uh, well, I suppose we can, we can have a post-game post, post -game discussion as to how he felt that went. Yeah, uh, I, I want to start with you. Video. Oh, that was interesting. Like, I did, yeah. I, I'm i glad to have had the experience where I was kind of being forced into giving more, more of my own opinion than I, than I would normally give, because I think I've sort of taken a bit of shelter in being, there's always stuff to talk about in a TFT game, so a lot of times I don't really need to venture an opinion because there's always something else to talk about. Yeah. How did you feel about it? I think it was fine. I feel like, obviously, this is not like the traditional play-by-play. -play. I was more of like a mediator to a certain extent, right? Like, I had, I had like some play-by-play -play moments, but obviously, like, I'm not warmed up either. So, like, this is not fully representable of like what I can do as a play-by-play -play caster. But obviously, it's not my niche either. I think it was fine. Like, I, I like the fact that I was able to come with like more of like short like reminders of specific things to like kind mm. of just like get back off your points right so i feel like if you if you put more of those points into your normal play-by-play -play commentary line like it's easier for me to like kind of create more of like a back and forth dynamic which is kind of like why i wanted to like do this exercise is for you to be comfortable in like giving those small tidbits if that makes sense yeah no i i agree i think that was uh, a pretty good like style because, yeah, I understand what you're trying to do there, which is to try and push my style to be more analytical. And I think, honestly, if anything, that's something which I, I need to 
do, if only, dear viewers, uh, to make those mistakes. I, th I think that's probably one of the things that's holding me back in my casting a lot at the moment is is not wanting to make mistakes. I think that that really diminishes my ability to grow because I'll stick to what I know will work and that's always going to be pretty much the same stuff. Yeah, cool. and, I, and I think that was like kind of like the entire point of this was just like kind of show a different way of play-by-play -play commentating in CFT as well for mm. me, right? Like... Yeah, I think yours was definitely, like, uh, much more on the sort of the hybrid end. But I think you also, you know, as we've discussed previously, the the actual play-by-playing -play isn't necessarily, like, the most important part. But I think what you did do, which was also a very important part of what's usually a player plays role, which is to keep the energy levels up and, you know, sort of build excitement for the stuff that was coming up. And I think that's, for TFT in particular, that's just as important as being able to actually do, like, play-by-play -play in the in the really important rounds yeah and obviously like i did kind of fuck over some unit names and stuff like that but again i haven't done any vocal warm-up um right like i'm not in the, in the in the full mindset of like what i need to do specifically all these things that are normally a play by play would be so it's much more of a systematic exercise more than it's like oh fuck i call cash or pay a snake again or whatever right um <laughs> i generally don't like i've seen that happen on professional league of legends casts at the lec like they'll just use descriptive terms rather than the actual name nobody cares as long as they as long as they're not actively confused by what it is you're referring to then that's the, that's the main thing uh, i will wrap the yep. recording up here uh but thank you uh thank you anyone who has watched through this uh do let me know if you've had any thoughts if this is an exercise you'd like to try as well uh because yeah I thank you, Vita, for doing this. I think it's been a really interesting experiment. All right, stop the recording. Bam.